this is a good moment to be talking about this sort of thing. Um, when I heard about Manuela's book, uh, I immediately ordered it, um, and, but it was a couple of months from now. Um, so when I was invited to be a moderator, I realized I can get an advanced copy this way. So I got one um, and I read it and I'm looking forward to having this conversation um, in a few minutes. Um, just to, by way of introduction, um, central banks are uh, typically regarded as conservative, politically neutral institutions that uphold uh, conventional macroeconomic wisdom. Yet in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis and COVID-19, um, central banks have upended observer expectations by implementing largely unknown and unconventional monetary policies. Um, in her forthcoming book, Unexpected Revolutionaries, How Central Banks Made and Unmade Economic Orthodoxy, Manuela Moschella argues that the political nature of central banks lies at the heart of these transformations. Um, we're gonna talk about that. Um, while formally independent, central banks need political support to justify their policies and powers. And to obtain it, they carefully manage the reputation among their audience, selected officials, market actors, and citizens. The press conference yesterday was an example of that. Um, challenged by reputational threats brought about by the 21st century recessionary and deflationary forces, Central banks such as the Federal Reserve System and the European Central Bank strategically deviated from orthodox monetary policies to preempt or manage political backlash and to regain political trust. Central banks so evolved into a new role, only in coordination with fiscal authorities and on the back of public contestation. Um, and so now uh, let me just introduce uh, Manuela Moschella, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is a professor of political science in the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the University of Bologna. She's one of the editors of the Review of International Political Economy and Associate Fellow at the European Program at Chatham House. Her research focuses on the politics of economic policymaking, the relationship between technocracy and politics, and the features of European political economy. Um, before opening, um, I want to mention this webinar is being live streamed, um, so recording will be immediately accessible. Um, use the Q&A box located in your Zoom menu to ask questions. Uh, please also give your name and affiliation. We'll take questions after our initial discussion, about a half an hour from now. Um, but feel free to enter them as you, as you think of them. Um, we'll have Manuela do a brief introduction, then move into our informal conversation before opening up the Q&A. Take it away, Manuela. Thanks, Barry. Thanks also for the nice introduction and for having me here. Um, so where to start? Uh, I think I can start by telling you a little bit more how I got interested in central banks in the first place. And my entry point into the central banking world, um, as you mentioned, Perry, I'm a political scientist, and I've always been interested in the institutional development, uh, in the development, in the trajectory of uh, political and economic institutions. Um, so, for instance, in the past, I've been working on the international financial institutions with this view to understand how they change their mandate, how they evolve over time. And, of course, central banks are, are, are a very intriguing object of investigation from these vantage points because, of course, since central banks were invented, right, were created in the 17th century, they've been evolving, right, because their mandate on financial stability, inflation, economic management, and the weight attributed to these different mandates has evolved over time. So I got completely intrigued by these institutions, also because they stand at this intersection between politics, they are uh, created by governments, but at the same time, you know, they oversee financial markets, they work in, in a peculiar way. Um, and so I was really intrigued to see how these institutions have been changing under, uh, really under my gaze, under my eyes since the 2008 global financial crisis and then during 2020, COVID crisis. And what I found fascinating is, is was particularly the pace and the acceleration of the transformation, probably because, uh, you know, when we used to think of central banks, uh, and as you also kindly mentioned in your introduction, we used to think of a peculiar type of institution, if you allow me, even a boring institution, right, that it was an institution that has come to be crystallized around this idea that central banks has to focus on fighting inflation, maintaining the price level, and doing the, it with just, you know, the interest rate policy. So it was a very narrow, 
not simple, but very narrow and easy to convey message about what the central banks can do. And in this war that had been taking place over the past three decades before the 2008 crisis, um, you know, these central banks has also avoided claiming overt responsibility over financial stability, over um, real economic objective, including uh, jobs, right? But then, I mean, in, in a decade, they have called into question all these mantras, right? Because they have been involved in maintaining financial stability. They even pushed for, you know, inclusive growth. Think about the US Fed uh, before the return of inflation, you know, with the revision of the monetary strategy. The same was happening in Europe with the ECB, you know, pushing for this social minded on fighting climate. Uh, they were blurring, uh, you know, the, the distance with fiscal authorities, you know, in buying assets from the government. So they were really calling into question, you know, the image that they've been built for over three decades. So that's how I, I became interested, you know, in central banks, because I thought it was an extraordinary transformation as compared, you know, to this crystallization of the role in domestic societies and the image that they have been built for over three decades. Um, but then, uh, you know, as every social scientist, when I started digging into this story of transformation, what really puzzled me were, you know, the position of many of my fellow political economists, uh, especially in political science, because the, the major narrative, you know, behind the transformation of, of central banks in, since post-2008 was mainly a story about technocracy. You know, it was basically a story of central banks that have learned the right lesson from the Great Depression, that have developed new ideas about how to maintain financial stability, about the need, how to do quantitative easing. Um, it was a story about central banks that were independent, and so they had the capacity to act, like the only game in town type of argument would have it. So it was really what they call in the book, there was this technocratic narrative. So central banks transformed and they could act exactly because they were technocratic, they were independent, they had the ideas and the expertise. And, you know, to me, uh, probably because I'm trained as a political scientist, I, I was completely unsatisfied with this view because uh, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, you know, these central banks are evolving, even if, you know, economic ideas haven't changed fundamentally, you know, and even the, the independence has not been completely transformed. So there, is, there should be something more. And for me, this something more is what I called in the book that central banks are political institutions. And what I mean by political institutions in the book is that, yes, they are independent. They are technocratic and spurred institutions, no doubt about that. But at the same time, they are still public institutions that have to operate in, in domestic political context. So they need some degree of political support. You know, they need to speak to different audiences because their independence, their powers, their mere existence depend on having some degree of political support, right? So that, that's what I'm, I'm interested in unveiling that at critical points in time, and I use the Fed and the ECB as my case studies, I show how the central banks took some of the most uncontroversial decisions only under specific circumstances, not when they got new ideas, when they developed new ideas or because they were particularly independent, but they took the most uncontroversial decisions in one of two circumstances. On the one hand, when they had government support, you know, that could provide them with a shield, you know, with a political cover for doing unconventional things. So they were not destroying completely the public image that they had been building up to the point. So they needed government support. And we can talk about it. This government support took different forms in the US and Europe, of course, because we, we are talking about two different polities. Or central banks took some controversial decisions, like the decision to embark on climate change in Europe or social inclusion uh, in the United States, when the public, you know, citizens, were very much against the central bank. So the, the, the central banks were kind of reacting to a negative political backlash. So that, the, that's what I'm trying to do in the book is to really to re-embed central banks in their domestic political context, not to deny their expertise, not to deny their independence, but to show that central banks speak to different audiences that range from financial markets, but also include governments and citizens. And so one of the messages that wants to convey also in this book is that, you know, 
most political science literature and political economy literature usually think of central banks as responding just to financial markets, you know, and it's it's true, of course, there, there have been moments in which central banks have been responding mostly to financial markets, but there are also moments, probably crisis moments, like the one that I record in the book, where other audiences like governments and citizens become particularly important in pushing central banks towards particular direction. And uh, I think that I'll stop here as a matter of introduction. Thank you very much. That's a good kickoff. Um, so embedding um, in, in uh, the domestic political context, um, the is your is your goal here, not just technocratic uh, institutions outside of politics. Um, so I have uh, four questions. Um, the first, you 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 indicated where you where you started that you're interested in the as a political scientist in this dynamic of institutional evolution, and you chose central banks because they seem particularly um, interesting kind of institution to you. Um, I wonder if now that you've finished the book, um, you reflect a bit. It seems to me, I'm just guessing this as someone who's written some books myself, that in fact, you also start as a European <laughs> with the European Central Bank. Okay, so that there's a specific location that you're coming from, a particular lens that you're applying. And so the ECB is your central bank. Okay. <laughs> And as you were studying, you then you realized, well, but the Fed is sort of the world central bank. Um, and that's a very important part of this story. And we need to bring that in. And you don't mention it, but in the book, there's a, a, a small section too about the Bank of Japan um, so that you got interested in other central banks um, as well. And it occurs to me, so here again, I'm guessing, interpreting, reading the book, um, that it's not just the ECB, but also the Euro crisis, okay, that that maybe was a stimulus to you. Um, and I just point out as a as a as a as a moment here that it was October 13th, 2013, when the liquidity swaps between the Fed and the European Central Bank were made unlimited and permanent, okay, as an attempt to support. The, the European Central Bank in its efforts to fight its basically domestic crisis. You know, the Euro crisis was a was a was a Euro crisis. So that so I, I'm I'm all of this is to embed the ECB not so much in just domestic European politics, um, but global politics. Okay, and the global connection with other central banks, um, which you it seems sounds to me you know about these things. I see I see them in your book. Um, but I'm asking you here maybe to reflect where your own journey from being a European focused on the ECB, the Euro crisis, to this now larger context that has emerged as a result of your of your research. Thank you very much, Barry. Um, I'm sure there are many biases uh, in my books, <laughs> not just because I'm a political scientist, but as you probably said, I'm also European. Um, on Europe and then to this global dimension. Um, one of my starting points when I started writing the book, in addition to my interest in the question of institutional change, was also the interest uh, in the question of deflation. I know that it sounds weird to talk about deflation now, now that we have been through uh, a couple of years of uh, a surge in inflation. But basically, I mean, I was also intrigued uh, by this question of uh, how should the central banks act in a deflationary environment, right? Because most of the thinking on central banking, you know, both in economics and, and political science is about, uh, you know, credibility as fighting inflation, you know, and the, the question of credibility in fighting deflation uh, is not center stage. And you kindly mention, and I, I'm very proud of that section of the book, the section in which I try to retell the historical experience of the Bank of Japan, because I think this is crucial, because in the book, I try to tell this story of how central banks emerged as distinct political institutions, uh, but deflation was one of those problems that was really left to the margins. Although there was the huge example of the Bank of Japan among high income countries, right? So um, you're totally right, it is uh, absolutely, um, you know, although I pick the Europe and, and the Fed and probably started mentally from Europe, there are also important central banks in the background. So deflation was the other bit uh, of, of the problem that I tried to understand. 
unpack uh, in the book. So what should the central bank do? On Europe, on Europe, you know, as a European, um, I wanted to go beyond the story of the Eurozone crisis uh, because I wanted to show that uh, despite the peculiarities of the Eurozone crisis that I tried to tell it also in the book, in the, in the chapter of the ECB, the challenges uh, that the ECB confronted in the end were very much similar to the Fed. Although I will get back to your question as the Fed, you know, and the dollar dominance uh, that you were implying. But for me, you know, the, the point that I wanted to make is that both central banks, uh, and of course they are compatible because they are two of the largest central banks in the world, they were fighting uh, similar challenges, you know, this deflationary environment, this financial stability risks, the struggle to revive economic activity. So both of them, so I was really trying to take the ECB out of the conundrums of the Eurozone crisis, because they were, I think that the ECB, like the Fed, were confronting, you know, similar structural trends, right, and similar problems. So that that, that was what I'm trying to do. Having said that, uh, I mean, it's uh, inevitable that when we compare with the United States, you know, sometimes we complain about American exceptionalism. I think it very much applies, you know, to our research. You know, the Fed is a peculiar central bank because it's, of course, the central bank of the reserve currency, right? And for for instance, when I closed the book, you know, and it was the return of inflation, um, with a colleague, we made some works for the European Parliament in, we were, in which we were trying to assess the spillover, you know, of monetary policy between the, 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 the Fed and the ECB. In that, in, in that particular moment, you know, European parliamentarians were particularly preoccupied with the spillovers of high interest rates in the United States to Europe. Right. But the, the same thing happened somehow in, in a deflationary environment. So uh, this story, uh, absolutely, the, the thing that I did in the book, uh, you know, to try to analyze, you know, the common trends that were uh, the, the two central banks in two different jurisdictions were confronting. In, uh, in doing that, I kind of bracketed, you know, the, the intersections and the spillovers between the two, because I was trying to show I mean, my point was that, you know, I want to show that different central banks in two different parts of the world were confronting similar challenges and they ended up doing similar things because the politics in the two jurisdictions pushed in similar directions. So that, that's what my thinking. But you are totally right that at the moment as I finish writing the book and especially with the return of inflation, um, it, it, it became evident to me that there is this intersection and the, and the spillover effect between what happened uh, between the monetary policy in the United States and how it reverberates, not just, you know, in emerging and developing countries, as we're used to think, but also in Europe, right? Because, of course, once the, the Fed started raising interest rates, the tightening, uh, you know, spilled over to Europe as well. Um, well, thank you. Uh, you... I'm interested in, I'm, I'm an economist and you're a political scientist. And so I'm, I'm interested in your uh, engagement with economics and how you used economics and how you viewed economics or, or the role of economists in this, in this process as, as well. Um, you know, trained economists are aware that it, standard economics sort of has this thing called lender of last resort, okay? Which is a get out of jail free card. Like you can break all the rules in a financial crisis and do whatever you want in order to put a floor on the crisis, but then you return. So that the point of inflation targeting, as you mentioned, and specifically the Taylor rule and other technocratic things like that is to anchor expectations about the long run. Um, and so it should not, from an economist's point of view, it should not undermine the credibility of a central bank that it's doing some wild things at a moment of crisis, okay? What undermines credibility is after the crisis is over, okay, and you are reverting to, to status quo ante, and you're not fighting inflation anymore, as you said was your job, and now you're doing something else. That's, that's where the problem comes. So I would just distinguish between those, which maybe is not quite as sharp in the book, but in economists' minds, it's very sharp, okay, that those are, that those are two different theories, a theory for inflation, uh, for, for, for special times, for emergency times, and a theory for normal times. And your politics, I think, is more about the normal times and a concern that the normal times after the crisis were deflationary times. They were different kinds of normal times. Um, and in this regard, you're, you're very sensitive, I see in the book, to the awareness of all central bankers that monetary policy is sort of asymmetric. Uh, 
that it's better at fighting in, at, at, at restraining the economy than stimulating the economy um, for various technical reasons having to do with what what the role the role of central banks in in the economy but politically <laughs> The you're you're coming from a point where you imagine politically there seems to be a kind of symmetry, like fight fight inflation, yes, fight deflation, yes. That that you're urging that there should be, or or there there's a there's an a, there's a there's a sense that politically those things should have equal strength, and this causes, of course, a problem for a central bank because it knows that the instruments it has are not so good at fighting deflation. Um, and as they weren't, we got to zero interest rates in the in the, in the global north, and then we started quantitative easing and forward guidance and all those sorts of things. So um, that tension between economics and politics is sort of also a tension between asymmetry and symmetry, um, and that plays out in politics, maybe in 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 ways that you're seeing. I don't know if you have a reaction. Maybe there's a question in there. More somewhere. than one, probably too many. Very <laughs> you raised. <laughs> <laughs> Too many interesting points. Uh, I mean, really, you raised uh, so many interesting points. Let, let me pick on two points. With, um, one is about, uh, you know, what you were saying, uh, how economies see the problem uh, and, uh, you know, the role of central banks in or after a crisis and this question of asymmetry. So let me pick on that. Um, I think I mean, if we go back with, uh, with our memory, right, of the period, especially after 2008, probably less so after the COVID crisis, but you may remember even among economists, uh, there was all this concern, right, that, uh, you know, central banks were really tarnishing their credibility, that they're doing lender of last resort and buying quantitative easing was problematic. And I think that one of the problem of, of these concerns was that the crisis was very, very long, right? It was a decade long crisis and it was a very difficult to distinguish what you were saying, are we in a crisis or are we out of a crisis? right, which can be extremely complicated, I guess, right? So after 2008, you know, it's difficult to say we have reached, I don't know, in 2011 or 2013, we were out of the crisis because, you know, especially, again, probably I'm, I'm biased by my European perspective, but Europe never recovered, right? We were talking about secular stagnation. So I think that in that period, this distinction, are we in or out of the crisis, became much more blurred and exposed central banks to a lot of criticisms, even from economists, right? That accept the view that in a crisis, the central bank can act you know, beyond the limits and can act as a lender of last resort. So I think that because of the length of the crisis, the difficulty of saying we are in or out, you know, that, that was extremely problematic and attracted central banks a lot of criticism, even from corners where probably normally criticism would have been much more muted. So that would be my, one of my first reaction. The other reaction on, on the asymmetry, which, which I think is extremely interesting, you know, in this debate between eco an economist and a political scientist. Um, let me start from what I try to argue in a book. Uh, in the book, I say that, uh, at least I try to say that, um, you know, there is an asymmetry uh, in fighting inflation or deflation, in the sense that central banks were to modern uh, central banks, in the sense central, central banks that uh, were forged after the Volcker, you know, shock, you know, the idea was that central banks should focus on fighting inflation. So they were really carved for, for, for doing that. Um, but for me, the asymmetry comes from the fact that this public image of central banks as institutions that fight inflation basically ties the central bank's end in a deflationary environment. Because if you have been saying that your task is to fight inflation and not to uh, put your credibility on the line and that uh, the moment you have to do something else because the context shifts to inflation, that becomes asymmetric. And central banks can find itself in difficult problem, not just because of economic reasons, the ones that uh, you would point out as an economist, but also because central banks have been nurturing a particular public image. And it's difficult to deviate 
from the public image, from the public posturing, right? So it becomes, you know, the prophet, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? We, we have been telling the public, we have been telling politicians that we control inflation and now we are trying to stalking inflation, right? So we are trying to revive economic activity in stalking inflation. And for me, that's where the asymmetry lies. It's exactly in the public image that central banks have deliberately built and that's what that's the problem that central banks confronted and that's how we should understand the transformation because if central banks confronted this as asymmetry because they tied their own ends right <laughs> it's not the governments that tie his own ends in, in delegating to the central bank in this case in a deflationary context central banks had tied their own ends by projecting this image of, of as just conservative institution so the moment they have to do something different than fighting inflation, but they have to stock inflation somehow. You know, I'm exaggerating, but the idea is that, you know, in a deflationary environment, you have to stock inflation, revive economic activity. They found themselves in trouble, right? Because they have to reinvent the role and they needed some degree of political support for doing that. Very interesting. So in, in the book, you refer to this asymmetry, which economists do it, pushing on a string, you know, the, 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 the language that, that, that you can't uh, expand as well as you can contract. Um, the and and uh, they oversold this. Um, at the time they oversold this was 1979. And in the book, you you tell the story about the Volcker shock, and you say that this was a key turning point. That the inflationary 70s um, was uh, was stopped. Okay, by by the Volcker shock in 1979. Um, and that uh, that changed that pivoted that changed the the, the world. Um, and you put that in domestic context in the United States that this is about you know, double digit inflation in the United States. This this is I, I just said you started maybe from the euro crisis. Okay, in 1979 I, I was in college. Okay, and I decided to become an economist. Okay, and so I I think probably if someone were to to look at my work they would say well that's when he got bitten by the money bug right then. It was Paul Volcker who did it, you know, in 1979. Um, but so I want to ask you a question about that origin, because, again, that's something that you come to in your research, that you're you're looking at COVID, you're looking at the great global financial crisis, but you track it back in history and you say that the origin of all of this is 1979. So now to reflect a bit on that, because there, there are some little pointers in your book about this suggesting that what was happening in 1979 was not so much domestic in the United States as as maybe as maybe you originally anticipated you know that in fact the United States the, the Fed did not as you say did not actually adopt explicit inflation targeting until 2012 with Ben with Ben Bernanke okay so that was exactly more or less the same time that it's also supporting the ECB with the liquidity swaps and so forth. So, so the explicit, so the Fed did not want to tie its hands to as an inflation targeter in 2012. The point of inflation targeting was sort of to tie other people's hands. You know, it came from New Zealand, it came from the global south. It was really, I would say, maybe more an attempt to stabilize the dollar at the apex of the global dollar system, um, which had been falling apart in the 70s. Um, that that the United States was now taking responsibility for being the central bank of the world, which had not really been in the 70s. You can see here that I'm channeling Charlie Kindleberger, <laughs> the subject of my of my previous book. But but this is all just to say that maybe the embedding central banks in domestic politics, okay, is a very good starting point, but maybe not enough. That there's that there's a sort of global politics that's that's part of this um, a, as well, and. As an American, I will say Americans are not happy with their central bank being the central bank of the world. Okay, um, the global financial crisis was a big political crisis for the Fed, precisely because of seven hundred billion dollars that it had lent to central banks around the world. The COVID crisis was not a political crisis for the Fed. The world, the, the United American Americans have accepted that the central bank of the United States is the central bank of the world. Apparently, so that's an a political story, which you don't tell because you're thinking about each individual central bank embedded in domestic politics, but but maybe that's the next step. Um, and so I'm interested to hear your reflections as a as a political scientist um, in the direction that I'm that I'm pushing you a little bit. No, thanks very. I'm glad to hear that the Volcker shock was a turning point for your own professional life as well. <laughs> glad to hear that. Uh, 
So the Volker shock, yes. Uh, in the book, I devote a lot of attention because, as you said, uh, for it, it's the starting point of my analysis because I want really to show how a certain image of central bank came to be crystallized after 1979. And as you rightly noticed, um, of course, I mean, it's uh, the book is mostly a story about the US on the one hand and, the, and Europe on the other hand. But the, the story, the, the historical chapter when I tell about Volcker and then about Greenspan is really a story that becomes global, right? Because I think it's it's a very, as a political scientist, it, it's a very fascinating case of policy diffusion, right? Where, you know, what are the lessons that an international community of economists, you now going back to your question before, what do you think about economists and their role in all this story? It's really the lessons that were that were drawn from, from the Volcker experience, right? And what came out from the Volcker experience was, was twofold, right? That you needed to have an independent central bank so that the central bank that does not adjust monetary policy to fiscal needs, and you need a central bank that is mostly preoccupied with inflation level and not other, you know, objectives. So that, and that's, it's it's part of the bigger story of the shift, right, from Keynesianism to monetarism, right? It's so, uh, there is all this discussion uh, about the change in macroeconomic thinking, that, that's the background, and it, it becomes really uh, an international story. But going back to one of the major threads of my book, I also try to show that there was, of course, this economic part, you know, Volcker story, the global story of the lessons that were drawn from the Volcker shock. But at the same time, there was also a, a politics that was supportive, right? If we think about the diffusion of central bank independence, if we just look at the data, of the rise of central bank independence, you know, the level of legal independence that was granted to central banks starting from the 1980s. We cannot just explain those data, just looking at the ideas that economists had on time inconsistency and on the need of the central bank to be independent. But of course, there was a political environment in, in many places, uh, in advanced economies, in emerging markets for different reasons, because they wanted to signal to international markets but there was a, 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 you know, a politics, you know, that wanted independent central banks. So they were fine in tying their hands and delegating this responsibility to, to central bank. Um, I think it was Buiter that called about there was a cosmic coincidence, right? That you know there was economic theory, but at the same time politics was aligned. That in, in most places, in most countries. Uh, governments and citizens probably were not particularly interested in central banks because the other thing is that I, I think that the politicization of central bank really happened after 2008, not before. But at least, you know, citizens uh, were OK with it. But so many governments around the world accepted the idea that a central bank should be kind of the post Volcker central bank. So that, that's the global story. Um, so having said that, uh, I completely agree that uh, on to the next level, there is much to be investigated about much broader, you know, global trends that have been taking place in central banks. The, while you were talking, you know, about global trends, uh, I was also thinking about uh, emerging market economies and unconventional monetary policy, which is a part of the book that I didn't really unpack, although it was in the background of my mind, because of course, most emerging market economies had been experimenting with unconventional monetary policies well before 2008, right? So that's another part of the story that could tell us about how you know monetary policy evolve and travel uh, across the world. Uh, thank you. See, I wish we could talk about this for a long time, but um, I have one more question, and then we're going to open it up to Q and A. I see there's no questions in the in in the Q and A yet. Um, but that's maybe because people are listening so much. Um, so, so my fourth and last uh, question: you, you, you began in framing um, by explaining to us that you're re you were responding to a discourse in political science that you found inadequate, a discourse that viewed the central bank as a technocratic institution um, that is learning from experience and implementing neutral political, politically neutral sort of uh, uh, optimal monetary policy to manage the economy and so forth. Um, and you're positioning yourself as a critic of that political science discourse. Okay. Now, once again, as an economist, okay, the economists, of course, invented 
most of this technocratic discourse, okay, is that 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 the 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 way that monetary policy gets discussed as being about well, what parameters should we put on the Taylor rule, you know, on on and what should the inflation target be, two percent, three percent, one percent? So this technocratic discourse um, is sort of invented by economists, um, and I I want to maybe suggest to you that. One of the reasons for this technocratic discourse is precisely to manage conflict, <laughs> to take to take what would otherwise be a political battle, okay, and shift it into a purportedly more neutral. Now, economists make big claims. You you mentioned many times people saying, "Oh, we have monetary science and so forth." Personally, I think this is this is overstating it. Okay, that's not true. That's not true. But you can see how effective this might be as a rhetorical device. That we're that leave it to us. You know, let's not let's not have the capitalists fight the workers. You know, let's let's talk about whether beta on the on the should be one point one or one point two. You know, so that that is a way of managing conflict in a complex modern modern economy. Um, I I don't see you know really anything of that because you want to. You want to reveal the conflict behind the scenes, but now that you've revealed it, I wonder if maybe you have a little more appreciation for why, for how, for the role that this technocratic discourse might be playing. That's an intriguing question, Perry. Um, <laughs> so let me start by saying that um, I agree with you. So I agree that um, from the, the Economist and this rhetorical device was massively successful right because the idea was really that uh you know as you say by focusing on the models on the parameters of the model um i think that not so hidden purpose right was really to neutralize the view of what monetary policy is about right that it's uh, to, to try to convey this message that is mostly you know something almost automatic right that you put an autopilot and the central bank and you know put the, the numbers in the model and they get you know the optimum interest rate so it was really done for this purpose it was really done to remove you know um you know monetary policy from a democratic arena right because of all the difficult and again th this was the volcker uh, uh, lessons or what we wanted to learn from the Volcker lessons, right? Because that was the message that came out from the 60s and the 70s, that if the central banks come too close to fiscal authorities and so to politics, then we get inflation, right? So the idea was, okay, we have these nice technocratic models and we remove monetary policy from politics. And um, it worked uh, for, for a bit, but I think that, uh, you know, in the end, there is always a backlash, okay? Because uh, we all know that we can pretend that it is a neutral exercise, but we all know that monetary policy, like all policies, right? They make winners and losers, they distribute costs in society. Uh, and so it is not surprising that, uh, you know, and, and that's a crucial part of my book when I talk about politics politicization, right? That's, and I mean by politicization exactly that at a certain point, you know, citizens, the public, the moment in which central banks were fighting in deflation, and so they were not just working with interest rates whose effects are generalized, but central banks changed their tools and use targeted purchases, you know, these uh, distributional consequences became much more obvious, much more visible. And this created, you know, a backlash. So central banks became unusually salient, you know, for citizens. Going back to Europe, which is the case that I know best, you know, the data on public opinion and trust towards the ECB are telling, you know, since 2008, citizens' trust in the ECB has plummeted and has not recovered since uh, you know 2008, uh, which is extremely fascinating, which speaks to the limits of this rhetorical device that you were talking about. You know, there is a limit to, to how much you can hide from the public. At the end of the book, am I reconsidering the benefits of you know using this rhetorical device? No, I don't think so. I think that um, you know one of the mistake. Uh, uh, that uh, it, it has been done in monetary policy is to really believe that by depicting monetary policy as technocratic, as out of democratic arena, um, 
you could govern without problem. But there is a moment in which, you know, democracy and uh, will prevail, right? So the question is to find, to find, it's a difficult one, right? But it's to find the right balance, you know, is to explain to citizens all the trade-offs that are at, play, at place and to try to take, and for central banks to take responsibility for their actions, right? So, but hiding, you know, and pretend or pretending that monetary policy is not distributional consequences, I think it's untenable, all right? It's, a, it's, it's untenable, and in the end, uh, it really risks nurturing a backlash, right, at central banks. And so if we care about central banks and if we care about price stability, we should find a way to make uh, monetary policy, um, I don't want to say democratic because probably it's not the right word, but to try to understand that uh, we cannot hide, you know, the consequences. And uh, it's a question of accountability and responsibility. Uh, but hiding, uh, I don't think it's the best strategy for, for central banks and monetary policy going forward. OK, thank you. Um, we're now we're now shifting to the Q&A part. Um, well, this was Q&A, I guess, but it was really <laughs> discussion between us. Um, and you and by the way, the audience should know we've had we've exchanged some emails beforehand so that we got acquainted a little bit. We'd never met before. So we could have a more productive conversation here. Um, the there are now some questions emerging in the Q and a. There are three. And I guess in this format, I just have to read them um because I don't see any other people that I can call on. So let me just, the first one is from um, Alex Howlett from the Gresham Institute. And he says, he asks, what should the primary policy objective of the central bank be? Fight inflation, financial stability. Why is there such a thing as the central bank in the first place? And then there are two more. So well, let's just take them in turn. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks for the questions, first of all. Um, uh, the, the first question about uh, uh, what should so it, it implies kind of a normative assessment uh here i mean as i said since the very beginning uh, the role of central banks has evolved over time and perry can tell you better than i can do it here uh you know the, the idea that money needs to be governed of course it, it, it has always been there and you know the weight attributed to different objective has changed over time right whether it should be financial stability as was the case when the fed was created or it should be price stability as was the case when the european central bank was created so again you know the the weight that is attributed and the thing is that of course that there are trade off potential trade off among all these mandates right because there are for instance trade off between monetary policy and financial stability because for instance you know uh, a central bank uh, the, the usual argument is that uh, for instance in the case of monetary policy and financial stability a central bank could um, be reluctant to raise interest rates to the optimum level if the financial stability is in trouble in the country. So that, that, that's one potential trade-off. But so um, it's not usually, I mean, the, I think that it's fair to say that the role of the central bank is to uh, maintain price stability, but there could also be other objectives. And I think that's where politics kicks in again. It's politics that decides the values that society prioritizes, right? So in the case of the ECB, when the ECB was created, the idea was that uh, there is a clear hierarchy of mandate and the, the, the main mandate of the ECB is price stability. It's not the case in, in the United States where we call it the, the dual mandate, right? Where, where you have, you know, the Fed is responsible for fighting inflation, but at the same time, maintaining full employment. Uh, but then in the case of the Fed, it's over time again, uh, you know, the Fed can weigh one mandate over the other more. Um, now, for instance, in Europe, there is this huge discussion on whether the central bank, the European central bank should expand its mandate and should give more weight to what is called the secondary mandate, that is all the other economic policies of the union, uh, including environmental policy, but which is, again, an, a very open discussion. But I think at the end of the day, it's again uh, a question on and goes back to the question of democracy that Perry and I were talking about before. Uh, if the if politics, you know, if, uh, you know, the, the governments of, of each country decide that the central bank has a mandate, this is democracy, right? It's, 
it's up to you know uh, governments to decide which is the best mandate that the central bank should perform uh, in any particular time. So the next we have questions from one from the global south and one from the global north. So um, as former governor of the Central Bank of Barbados and an exponent of unconventional monetary policies, I'm intrigued by what you discern of unconventional monetary policies in EMEs. Um, this is Dalil Worrell. I This is not so much a question, but let me turn it into a question um, because I, building off of your last answer that you're one of the reasons that we have unconventional monetary policies in the global south is that they're more concerned with economic development than they are with price stability and using whatever tools are available to them, including the central bank, to facilitate those social goals. Um, a, and uh, the and so now mentioning climate, you know, this is a social goal that the go that the global north is now confronting. And the question is, what? How can the central bank maybe help? And that may be part of what's happening is that we're recruiting the central bank to help in a kind of war finance, big push, you know, save the planet. Okay, instead of price stability seems a rather a rather small goal compared to, uh, you know, three degrees centigrade. Um, and uh, so maybe you want to comment on, on that. Absolutely, I think uh, that's uh, uh, an absolutely important question. Um, just to connect, you know, the book to what I'm working on right now, because I finished off the book with this idea that central banks had ended up in a place of increased monetary interventionism. And what I'm working on right now, I'm intrigued by, you know, all these forms of public state interventionism in market economy for these big challenges, the climate change that Perry, you were mentioning. So what, what is the role of public authorities from central banks to government in guiding the transition, but also, you know, for industrial policy that is related, right? So what should we have an industrial policy, how we restructure our economies, also, you know, related to the goal of climate change. And in that respect, I'm also studying, you know, the experience of central banks have, I have not delved as yet into the experience of emerging market economies, but I want to do that. And uh, I'm happy that there was this question, but they come from Italy. And Italy is also a country where, you know, the central bank uh, and, and the financial system uh, in the past, in the 19th, after the Second World War, was really thwarted towards uh, supporting developmental objectives so that uh, the government use a central bank credit and credit allocation uh, and interest rates in order to support you know, domestic uh, activity, to, uh, to support the development of particular industries. And so the, I think this is an important point. This is an experience that is worth uh, undigging, uh, digging into it in order to understand uh, how can we do that the restructuring of our economies uh, that, that we have to confront, right, because of the challenges of climate change, because of change uh, geoeconomic conditions. So I'm absolutely intrigued. I do not have an answer as yet. Uh, but I think that uh, to go back to the way you put it, Perry, I agree with you that thinking of central banks today as just targeting inflation, it seems very small of a task. Uh, in front of the challenges that our societies are confronting, honestly. And uh, again, uh, I think that in the end, uh, first of all, it's up to domestic governments to decide the directions where central banks should be heading, including, if necessary, to support you know, the fight against climate change or to support uh, developmental objectives, whether it is, uh, you know, to support, uh, you know, the allocation of credit in certain sectors, in certain technologies, and so on and so forth. Um, so now I have a, a question from the, glo the Global North that I mentioned, um, from Timon Forster from the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. Um, thanks so much for the talk. I'm wondering whether you could discuss a bit more who we should think of as the central bank. I'm interested in this. To what extent do we need to consider organizational culture or individual central bankers as norm entrepreneurs or are central banks relatively unitary actors in your account? So unpacking the internal politics, I guess, inside. And, and I would just, to, 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 to riff off of our previous conversation, understanding the relationship between central bankers and the economic profession, for example, um, running cover for them or, or, or creating models for them, or the relationship between the central bank and the treasury, 
you know, that uh, in, in within within the government. Um, so the there's politics there too, right? That is that is maybe maybe worth unpacking. And wonder if you have thoughts on that. And then when you finish that, there's a bunch of other questions that have come in. I'm just going to read them all, and then you can pick and choose whatever you want to respond to. All right, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an important question and it's something I've been grappling with uh, while I was writing the book. So how I should present central banks. Um, so in the book, I try to present them as collective actors. Okay, so more as to, to use the language uh, that is raised in the question, I try to use them as more unitary actor where you know there is kind of um, a clear um, public image, you know, it's, a, it's an institutional image. Although in, uh, in the two case studies that I have, uh, where I could use, you know, especially in the case of the Fed, where I could use the mills, uh, in the case of the, of the ECB, it's more complicated because the, uh, the, the transcripts that the ECB uh, make public are not uh, as detailed as the one that the Fed uh, makes available. So I tried also to unpack a little bit the dynamic that takes place within the central banks. The fact that central bankers, so not just the institution, but central bankers within the institutions might have different views. And it's not just the board of governors or the executive board in the ECB, but also the staff of those central banks. But in the book, I do not really get at the differences uh, that, uh, of course, existed and have always existed within uh, complex uh, institutions like central banks. So I try in the book, I depict them mostly as unitary actors taking the official position as, uh, you know, the, the position of the central bank. But of course, it is not meant to say that there was consensus on everything, on all policies issue within the central bank. The same thing applies to the, the relationship with the economic profession that Perry was rightly pointing to. Uh, you know, uh, in the book, I, I, I tell the story of how, you know, the shift in macroeconomic thinking affected uh, monetary policymaking and so monetary practitioners, but they do not really delve into this complicated relationship, which I think, however, is, is extremely important and interesting. Uh, in related publications, uh, publications that of course were informed by the book, I looked much more explicitly at the divisions within central banks. I did it especially for the ECB, where together with some co-authors, we analyzed, for instance, uh, the differences uh, among the European central bankers according to the nationality of origins in order really to understand uh, you know, the, the ECB is interesting, of course, because it's a supranational central bank, you know, it's a supranational, it's a central bank of 20 countries, which I think it makes it amenable to study, you know, the differences that uh, are among central bankers, you know, the governors of the central bank. But in the book, to go back to, to, to the main question, I mostly use central bank as unitary actors, but not to hide the differences that are that they are inside. Uh, so let me just uh, read the questions that remain, and you can pick and choose. Um, the There's a CBDC question, central bank digital currency, just for those who aren't used to these acronyms. Do you view this as a revolutionary tool uh, in the toolkit or just a repackaging of existing tools? How might the politics of central banks explain patterns of CBDC development? So that's our crypto question. Um, second, um, I agree, of course, the technocratic language models and so forth is often just a rationalization of underlying political views, but how to make sense of the fact that it was precisely a Keynesian, um, Arthur Oaken, who came up with the idea of an output cap. Um, how can we get to the synthesis between ideas are just epiphenomenal versus ideas as causal here? So the role of ideas, I guess, is the question. Um, third, um, from Amsterdam, um, my question related to treating central banks as domestic political institutions. What explains the simultaneous transformation of central banking policies in different countries as if they were domestic institutions supported by governments and pushed by citizens, for example, uh, for instance, for controversial policies such as climate issues? You know, if it was domestic, I guess we might expect to be more variation. The fact that they're moving in the same direction is a, is a puzzle then. Um, what does this tell us about the politics of central banking in general? To what extent can we talk about central banks as domestic political institutions? So in some ways, that's my global question. Um, fourth, um, 
What aspects would you recommend future scholars to evaluate monetary revolutions in other regions? So uh, based on your findings, um, other than the Eurozone, US, Japan. So that's extending this. Um, and then a specific questions about how the ECB works. Um, the European Central Bank, does it deal with both Euro countries as well as countries that do not use the Euro in the EU? Um, so that's a specific technical question. Maybe you want to deal with that one first and then deal with the bigger ones. Or it's up to you. You pick and choose. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm going to start with uh, the question about the different directions or why do we see the Fed and the ECB going in the same directions, although they are two different countries. Um, of course, in, in presenting the book during this talk, um, I presented the general trend. But in the book, I said that, of course, the, the Fed and the ECB, they both move to unconventional monetary policies. So they all, both of them question orthodoxy, and this is the general trend. And I explain it because politics went in the same way in the sense that domestic governments ultimately supported central banks and citizens politicized the central banks, pushing it to do something different than the two central banks had been doing up to the moment. But of course, exactly because as the question reads, the two jurisdictions are different, the timing and the modalities have been different on the two sides of the Atlantic. You know, the, uh, you know, the, the politics, the political support that took place in the United States was different than the one that took place in Europe. So, you know, the U.S. was much quicker in, in, in endorsing unconventional monetary policy than in the ECB was. Is exactly because, you know, government support in Europe took much longer to cobble, you know, for, for governments to come together. And also, which I think it's very, very interesting, you know, both the Fed and the ECB revised their monetary strategies before the return of inflation. It was 2020, 2021. And in the book, I say that both institutions changed their monetary strategies uh, because they were trying to respond to negative public opinion. So they were trying to show that, that to, 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 they were trying to respond to the signals coming fr from citizens. But however, since, I mean, these are two different political environment, the, the Fed went towards inclusive growth, while the ECB went towards climate change, reflecting the different um, concerns that citizens were expressing in the two countries. So I tried to link public opinion data with what you know the, the, the central banks were doing. So they, they both went social somehow, but the Fed prioritized uh, uh, inclusive growth while you know Europe went for climate change. Um, then, the, it, it, since there are just two minutes, I think I'm going to just uh, reply to the question how to study future, you know, central banks and, and, and kind of revolutions that I uh, analyzed in the book. I think, I mean, my book ended up uh, really when the inflation was returning. And I think it's the big question, I think, now is really to understand what's going to happen next, right? What's going to happen after this um, interest rate cycle. So if we will go back to normal, if you know uh, the, the, the revolution that had been taking place over the past decade will be reverted, or if something that happened of post-2008 will remain there. I think this is probably one of the biggest questions that I still haven't solved. And the other one is, of course, about the relationship between independence and democratic politics, which is a very complicated one. Because while I was replying to you, Perry, about um, whether we should hide monetary policy from the public uh, through rhetorical devices, at the same time, we should be aware right, of how difficult it is to do monetary policy uh, in, in democratic settings. So I think that these are probably the most important questions uh, I would point out. Thank you very much. Um, we, speaking for myself, I could go on for hours and hours, but our hour is done. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you for the audience too. And this will be, this has been taped. And so it will be um, on YouTube and you can tweet it out to all your friends who missed this wonderful, interesting conversation. Um, let me also in closing, invite you to um, the next one of these book talks, um, which is uh, by Alex Cantacalanus and Thomas Stubbs, A Thousand Cuts, social protection in the age of austerity, um, and that will be May 7th. Um, my understanding is that if you signed up for, if you registered for this one, then you're automatically registered for the next one um, and you will get a, a notification. Um, and that will be the last book talk for the spring semester here. And we hope to see you back then. <laughs>